Okay, great. So I'm Joy Lovestrand. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at SOAS at the University of London and happy to be able to host this uh, linguistics webinar today. Our speaker is Dr. Nala Lee. Nala is the Assistant Professor of English Language and uh, in, in the English Language and Literature Department at the National University of Singapore in US. Uh, before that, she had done her PhD at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and also spent a year at Stanford University as a postdoctoral fellow. Nala has worked extensively on the languages of Singapore, including Babu Malay and colloquial Singapore English and has more generally worked in language documentation and description, linguistic typology, contact languages, and language endangerment, and has agreed to share today some of her most recent work on the spatial network properties of endangered languages. So Nala, thank you for agreeing to be with us today and to share this research still in process. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. So thank you for the invitation, Joey, and thanks for organizing this in general. Let me share my screen. Okay, um, begin over here. So, okay. So hi everyone. Thanks for coming to today's talk on spatial network properties of endangered languages. Clearly with my day job as a documentary linguist and as a pluralist, I'm not an expert at network analysis. So this talk was only possible because it was born out of collaborative efforts with my colleague, Dr. Cynthia Siu. So I think I should acknowledge the names over here. Um, she is a psycholinguist and a cognitive um, scientist who uses, utilizes network analysis in her work on cognitive structures. So she mainly works on the mental lexicon. But uh, we were talking and our broad interests align roughly in the study of language patterns. So she decided maybe we could apply our tools here to see if this was meaningful. So um, we came together to do this work. And here we are interested in the spatial patterns of endangered languages. So um, Cynthia wasn't able to make it today, but we are excited to share this work. So apologies in advance if I do not handle the methodology questions as well as I should be. Uh, they can be directed to Cynthia at the email address that you see over here. Um, and then I will try to present it as simply as I can as they were introduced to me a couple of years ago when we first started to get together to do this work. So it's, it's kind of interesting what happens when you go climbing together and you end up coming with paper like this. So this is this is a result of that. Okay, um, so let me try to contextualize what we're trying to do here today. I think it needs um, no belaboring that um, language endangerment is occurring at an unprecedented rate and magnitude. Um, so you guys most probably know this, but it, it's worth um, bringing it up each time. So uh, um, while the issue of language endangerment and, um, had been broached as early as the, as the 1940s by Maurice Ladish, there is no denying that language endangerment is now occurring at a more unprecedented, unprecedented rate. Also because um, we are more aware now of uh, recent data that allows us to kind of um, establish more accurately the rates at which it occurs. So um, of course, we're familiar with the numbers 50 to 90% of the world's languages um, becoming more abundant the, by the end of this century. But um, there's also more recent data from the catalog of endangered languages, which suggests that one language goes um, dormant every three months or so. So I use the word dormant here to mean languages that have gone extinct in the last 50 years or so, or languages for which we are not as sure if um, there's still a last speaker, or we're not sure about the demise of that last speaker. So uh, regardless of rate, we are also aware of the immense consequences of um, language loss for the speech community and for humanity. It affects um, the social psyche of the speaker, their well-being. It also affects linguistic diversity and um, knowledge for humanity in general. So over here, there's, so that there's no belaboring it, it's, it's kind of an important issue. So over here, we hope to shed light on the issue, um, in particular on how these languages pattern spatially. So we can explore spatial relationships between languages with the crucial, crucial assumption that came up in the work of Linda Bronham, Felicity Meekins, and their co-authors. So the assumption here was that uh, languages that um, cluster in space share similar sorts of social realities um, in their shared environments. So these would be socio-economic uh, and historical factors, among others. 
Um, and the approach here that we take is a quantitative one involving computational spatial modeling. The data that we utilize come from the endangered catalog of endangered languages known in short as LCAT, which is meant to feature all languages that are known to the LCAT team to be at some level of risk. Uh, when we were utilizing the data in it, there were about 3,423 languages featured on LCAT. So the current version has got 3,456 languages. If anyone's interested in the changes between then and now, it's about an increase of 23 languages uh, from the time we started utilizing this data set. Okay, so uh, we were motivated in some way by the gap that there were clearly was in terms of um, what had been previously done. So while there has been work that situates endangered languages in space, much of this work took the approach of demarcating the languages by known regions, for example, by treating the languages in Australia as a group or by viewing the languages of New Guinea as a natural group. So um, the issues of um, language endangerment have also been conflated together with um, talk of linguistic diversity and understudied languages. Um, so this, this was done in uh, the work by people such as Greg Anderson, for example. Um, well, and it's also been subsumed in discussion of uh, bioculture diversity uh, by people such as Lowen Harmon um, in what appears to be a twin track model of loss even. So the loss of languages then implying the loss of cultural diversity, uh, which supposedly occurs alongside the loss of uh, biodiversity. So discussing these issues in the same breath is not a bad thing at all, it's a good thing. Uh, it brings about its benefits as um, language endangerment then gets a lot more attention since the reality is that um, the endangerment of um, other entities such as mammals uh, would be much higher up on the radar of most people than of languages. So when you talk about these things together, people start paying attention to what the issue is. Um, and when tackling these issues, um, shared resources are technically an advantage in a world of limited resources. Um, Yet, at the same time, there's also work suggesting that these concepts can be decoupled um, and that um, doing so would um, allow us to uncover a lot more about um, these patterns of endangerment. So, Turvey and Petrarelli, for example, show that while there are significant positive relationships between language richness um, and um, between language richness in human populations as well as species richness, um, in among non-human mammals at different spatial scales in New Guinea, there's also significant negative correlation between the distribution of threatened languages and threatened mammal species. So, um, so perhaps we want to kind of um, bring apart those concepts and just look at language engagement on its own accord for a start. So in this paper then, we attempt to do that, um, strip away everything else, look at language engagement hotspots on its own accord uh, we do not pre-demarket areas of endangerment, but we rather allow the data to speak for itself by using quantitative computational means. Okay. So the methodologies utilized in this paper uh, fall under the branch of network analysis. So it might be good to quickly talk about what networks are like in this framework that we're utilizing. So uh, very simply, you can think of a network as a structure that represents a group of entities and the relationship um, between these entities. So that's what's represented, the entities and the relationship between these entities. So um, as drawn in this diagram, this, this simple diagram that I've coughed up, um, a node here would refer to the entity that's being analyzed. Um, and an edge, uh, which is the technical term used over here for the, those connecting lines between these nodes, would represent the relationship that we are interested in analyzing between these entities. So for example, um, if you are studying the social media network of um, Instagram or even TikTok or Facebook users, then the nodes would represent those users themselves, Instagram or TikTok or Facebook users, whereas the edges would be the follow, following relationships, for example. So um, that would be what a social media network looks like. Um, and if you're studying how, um, God forbid, COVID spreads, then each node might represent individuals and the edges then can represent the domains of interaction. 
such as uh, the sphere of the family, the school, the workplace, or even the marketplace, um, among other things. So um, any sort of um, network can present itself for analysis, including social networks, as I've mentioned, um, traffic networks, networks of the mental lexicon, as in uh, Dr. Cynthia Seuss work. Um, and over here, we're interested in a spatial network. So, and there are many ways in which these nodes and relationships can be analyzed. Okay. So here, we are concerned with the spatial network of um, endangered languages, and we have constructed the spatial network using two pieces of information that are crucially featured on the catalog of um, endangered languages. Okay, so these include the level of endangerment that each language is at, so its endangerment status. Um, it also includes the language's geographical coordinates in terms of its latitude and longitude. So um, each node, as you see in, over here, uh, would then represent the location of each language and the edges, oops, um, and the edges that you see over here uh, would represent um, the harvest sign distance between latitude and longitude. So harvest sign distance is um, something that's usually used for calculating paths, uh, for calculating geographical distances between various points on Earth, because um, it's also known as the great circle distance, um, and it represents the angular distance between two points on the surface of a sphere. So it's good for analyzing these um, locations of languages spread up across the globe. Okay. So uh, very quickly, I think it's um, important to introduce you to the source uh, from which the data is taken for a better understanding of the nature of the data. So um, the Endangered Languages project is accessible online at www.endangeredlanguages.com. Um, so you may already know about it, but um, if you don't, it's a platform that uh, was conceived initially and still um, does so. It was conceived allowing the sharing of information and resources on endangered languages. So this was a project that was initiated by google.org, uh, not google.com, but google.org. So um, it's, it's kind of supposedly philanthropic branch. Um, and, um, and, but now it's kind of fully run by linguists and people who, and, and people who are stakeholders. So um, we aren't as interested in safe languages. So the languages that are featured here are languages that are known to be at some level of risk. Um, the platform has in general been useful for raising awareness um, about language endangerment, where it occurs, um, what it looks like at various, um, in various places. And users are not only encouraged to access the information, um, they are also, and the samples that are provided by partners, they are also encouraged to submit um, information or samples in the form of text, audio, or video. So I guess like when it was conceived, it was thought of as a uh, kind of a data sharing or a, a shared platform for, for everyone. Um, and one of the reasons why was that it was meant to be uh, continually updated. So if people knew that there was um, something that was inaccurate on the website, then they could write to uh, people who are handling the project and that information can be updated. Of course, um, everything's subject to review by the area experts. So um, one of the central features of the Endangered Languages platform or um, ELP is the Endangered Languages catalog that I previously mentioned. So known in short as LCAT by the team. Um, so LCAT's aim is to provide up-to-date, uh, reliable and comprehensive information on endangered languages. So one thing that, uh, that struck us when we first came up uh, with the idea of doing this was that uh, a lot of, um, there are a lot of resources available, um, different sorts of websites, uh, databases available, but um, a lot of them were not very well maintained. Um, the information from them was taken from the 80s, um, numbers as well. And census numbers and so on and so forth. So we kind of wanted to provide something that was more up to date. Um, and it was then produced by a team at the University of Hawaii at Manoa uh, with a team from Eastern Michigan University and with grants from, of course, the National Science Foundation and states as well as Lewis Foundation. Um, and the initial technological assistance was rendered by Google.org. So the platform is currently managed by the First People's Cultural Council, um, a team at UH and a governance council. 
uh, with the data being maintained mainly by the team at UH. So a uh, feature of the um, a well-kept then importantly to us for this paper is the language endangerment index or lay um, as we formally call it because it came out of Hawaii. No, it was a coincidence that we called it lay, but it came out of Hawaii. So, um, and this was developed for the purposes of uh, LCAT and it's supposed to establish the extent of endangerment for each language. Uh, the reason for doing so is that, uh, let, me, let me get to that a little bit later. So um, some of you may have come across um, ELP, but just in case you haven't, I find it useful um, to share what it looks like on the website. When you access it, you view a map of the world's um, and Egypt languages represented as dots. So here I kind of have a view of um, um, the area of um, Asia surrounding, like just because, um, but you get, you get a world's map. And um, these different colored dots correspond to various levels of risk that the individual languages are facing. As long as we have the geographical coordinate, we can kind of put it here. Um, as is clear from this, that's, that's one piece of information that we have for uh, many of these languages is geographical coordinates. Um, and depending on whether that information is available, more regarding the language's um, level of vitality or endangerment because these levels of vitality and endangerment are kind of like two sides of the same coin. Um, and information about the social circumstances are also represented at different levels on the site. So what do I mean? So if kind of hover, um, not quite sure if you can see my cursor over here, but if you kind of hover your cursor around Southeast Asia, around the Malay Peninsula, then you might see um, this pop up. So Baba Malay, that information over there on Baba Malay that um, it's critically endangered and that it has 2000 speakers, um, that information pops up. And then when you uh, click on the individual um, languages, you get a uh, more extended set of information, um, including how the language fares um, on particular scales. So over here, we have uh, domains of use, we have um, speaker number trends, and we have um, intergenerational transmission, whether or not the language is being passed on to younger speakers. Um, then, of course, there's other sorts of information as well. So I kind of had to kind of screenshot this and fit it in nicely. So there's a little bit of information that's missing, but you can see that if that information is available, um, there can be information such as whether or not there are young children who speak the language, so zero, whether there are young adults who speak the language, zero, so, um, and that the elders are that speak the language mostly. Um, this language also has, for example, no government support and um, no institutional support. Then there would be other sorts of information that this is populated with. There is also uh, qualitative information where qualitative information um, that's helpful for establishing um, its level of vitality is available. That kind of qualitative information would also uh, be available. And of course, if, if people um, upload their video clips or their audio clips or information about the language, then you can see that information at, um, at that level as well. So, but uh, importantly over here then um, are those three skills that you see in the speaker numbers because um, that helps us establish the level of endangerment or vitality on the um, language endangerment index. Okay. So, uh, and because one of the major data points of this study, not only is this geographical coordinate, which I kind of showed you how it looks like on the um, database, um, the other major point or data point that we're looking at is the level of endangerment that each language is at. So we have to kind of broach how the language endangerment index or lay works in a very general way. Um, so why did we have to come up with an index uh, when there are other kinds of um, ways of assessing language vitality out there? We found that a lot of these methods uh, did not um, require very specific types of information that we did not necessarily have on many of these world's languages. So, um, and some of these um, methods of assessment did not allow for the languages to be compared um, to be looked at in a comparable way. So we wanted to be able to come up with something that could be utilized regardless of the amount of information that was available. So what do I mean by this? So um, lay is meant to provide a level of engagement um, for any language based on four criteria. 
So these four criteria are not only deemed to be important, but um, they're also found to be much more easily available than other types of sociological information. So, um, so the data has also got to be um, comparable on a scale uh, for the kind of work that we were doing. So uh, when my colleague John Van Wey and I were developing the scale, we found that there were other types of sociological information um, that would clearly affect levels of endangerment, such as language attitudes. Um, so there's no doubt that um, language attitudes is very important when you're talking about um, the viability of the language. But at the same time, uh, that was one of piece of information that was not readily available. If there was any information that was most readily available, it would actually be speaker numbers because a lot of linguists um, who were doing work much earlier on uh, did not say very much about the sociological circumstances of the language and they were relying on census reports that were made available, government census reports or census reports um, carried out by other um, agencies. So, but they didn't describe uh, a lot of this, these descriptions would um, lack information such as language attitudes. And language attitudes at the same time are much harder to quantify. So for those reasons, these are uh, the four criteria that we are looking at um, when we talk about lay. So the first of these four criteria would be intergenerational transmission, without which we know that there's kind of no viable future for the language. So taking the leap out of Fishman's notion of um, disruption to intergenerational transmission. So uh, because of how important it is, it's doubly weighted on our scale. Um, then absolute number of speakers is yet another important factor for the reason that I just mentioned. Sometimes there's no information on uh, the language itself except for um, speaker number uh, because of the census reports that are available. And um, while some people might kind of question this because they might say that, you know, there's strong intergenerational transmission um, in small communities and there could be possibly weak transmission in large communities, there is no denying that very small communities um, are much more at risk than uh, very large communities. So speaker numbers um, was featured here. Uh, but to mitigate that, we also have um, speaker number trends itself. So um, when we are dealing with speaker number trends, we are interested in whether numbers are increasing decreasing or stagnant. So based on a few reports over the years, we've got that information. So finally, we have um, domains of language use. Again, following, uh, again, following up on one of Fishman's um, initial ideas. Here, the assumption is that um, languages that are used in more domains are less threatened than those used in less domains. So if you use the, a language at the marketplace and at work and at school, that language would most probably um, out live a language that was only used in the home domain. So that's, that's kind of natural. So the language that's being assessed is scored on these scales and the final tallied score corresponds to a particular level of endangerment ranging from safe to critically endangered with uh, vulnerable, threatened, severely endangered as labels that are in between. So, um, what the lay does so differently from other um, assessments of language vitality is that not all factors have to be utilized given that perfect information, it's, uh, perfect knowledge is always is often rare. Um, but rather a certainty score can be given based on the number of factors um, used. So if you, I'm not going to go in more into it, but if you're interested, um, there's a resource over there that I've cited. So uh, note also that um, dormant and awakening are labels that are used by LCAT, um, but these are not scores that are operationalized on the scale, but um, they, they're just, they're there. Okay, okay, phew, so that was the data. So using that data with the geographical coordinates and with the endangerment statuses, we then constructed a spatial network of um, endangered languages computationally. So, and we were, we analyze um, this structure at three different levels. So at the macro level, we were interested in what the broad patterns were, and we undertook this investigation by looking at assortative pattern mixing. So I will elaborate on what these individual types of analysis mean later on, but for now, I'm just going to quickly run over the types of analysis that uh, we utilize. Then at the meso level, we were interested in where natural clustering took place. And for this, we utilized a sort of um, community detection analysis. So where natural communities were to be found, 
uh, we use the Louvain community detection method. So I'll again elaborate later on. Um, then at the micro level, we wanted to find out much more about the uh, location of it, each individual language that was at risk. And for this, we undertook an analysis of closeness centralities. Um, so again, I'll elaborate later on, and then uh, we can talk a little bit more about what the implications of this um, measure of closeness centralities uh, mean for other things like um, linguistic diversity. Okay, so where macro level analysis was concerned, again, um, looking at assortative mixing patterns meant that we were looking for a bias in favor of connections between network nodes of similar characteristics. So um, the question, simply put, is um, looking at how similar your neighbors are to yourself. So, um, so if I'm a very severely endangered language, is my neighbor equally severely endangered or is it a less endangered language? So um, here, the characteristics, yeah, the characteristics that we were interested in is the level of endangerment. A positive assortative mixing uh, number would usually mean that languages would be uh, what usually mean that nodes are surrounded by other nodes with similar characteristics, then a negative number would mean the opposite. So in the case of our spatial network of endangered languages, the positive assortative mixing uh, pattern would mean that languages tend to be surrounded by languages that are similar in terms of level of endangerment. Um, and uh, if we had a negative number, it would mean that um, languages would be surrounded by languages that do not share similar endangerment values. So here we actually find evidence of uh, positive assortative mixing. So with a positive correlation coefficient, and this was at a significant value. Um, so all of this was done in R, um, and Cynthia wrote the quotes for this. So what this means is that critically endangered languages tend to be surrounded by other languages that are critically endangered. And then that languages that are less endangered tend to be surrounded by other languages that are less endangered. So um, with this, we actually have natural groupings that occur. Uh, so what the positive assortative patterns in our structure points to are these natural groupings, um, like languages towards like languages. Um, and this actually indicates the prevalence of a uh, language endangerment hotspots around the world. So, but of course we want to know what those hotspots look like or what it looks like on a map. So this is, uh, this is where our next analysis leads to. So then um, at the meso level, we wanted to uncover communities of nodes that were more interconnected within those communities than outside of those communities. In other words, we wanted to know where the natural clusterings could be found. So the Louvain, again, the Louvain community detection method was utilized. Um, we found 13 communities, and these uh, communities did not necessarily um, were not necessarily directly associated with the continents they were on, for example, but we'll, we'll look at what they look like very soon. So um, the community size is the third. Uh, there were communities as small as 11 languages to as large as 550 languages. And these communities had a modularity structure of 0 0.77, which indicates that the community structure is overall very robust in nature. So this is what our 13 communities look like. So for a little bit of color and not so many numbers with this. Um, so from the uh, left of this map in sequence of kind of how we've numbered it, um, we have concentrated areas of um, endangered languages that correspond to areas in West Africa. And then we have another natural clustering um, in um, Southern Africa. And then yet another natural clustering in East Africa, number three. And number four, we've got um, languages within Western Europe, Middle East and Northern Africa clustering together. So these are the endangered languages in these regions. Um, and number five, we've got um, the southern parts of Central Asia, um, the southern parts of East Asia, South Asia, and mainland Southeast Asia clustering together. It's kind of a big one. Um, then uh, where am I? Okay. Then we've got number seven, the Philippine Islands grouping together with uh, Melanesia, Western Melanesia and Australia. So this is yet another natural clustering that occurs. Um, in terms of the patterns that we see uh, where vitality statuses are concerned. 
Um, and then uh, Eastern Melanesia stands on its own, like the languages within their pattern on their own. Then we have yet another uh, region within the Micronesia, Polynesia, and New Zealand. We've got one um, in uh, North America and um, parts of Northern Asia. So it kind of uh, overlaps over there. And we've got a region in Central Africa, uh, sorry, sorry, Central America. Um, and then we have a Southern part of South America and the Northern part of South America. So these are individual um, clusterings that naturally occur based on how these um, language and region values pattern. Then the different stacks that you see here at the bottom of the map show the different compositions of each community. Um, so uh, what you can see is that these have different compositions in terms of how endangered language these languages are with the darker colors corresponding to higher endangerment values and the lighter colors corresponding to uh, lower endangerment scores. Um, and then if you see the grayed out portions, those would be languages that are dominant. So usually languages that have gone extinct uh, within ve in very recent years. Um, so very quickly, if you were just to quantity, quant qualitatively uh, look at the data, uh, what we see is that some communities are faring far worse than others in terms of having proportionately more languages at higher levels of risk endangerment than others or having more languages gone dormant recently than others. So the communities um, that have more dominant and critically endangered languages include those of the southern parts of South America. So there's a huge one over here where lots of languages have gone dominant recently. And actually one more has gone dominant recently. I think Yamana has gone dominant recently as well. So this actually, this, this proportion over here should actually be increased. Um, then the other ones that, uh, that seem of note would be um, the Philippine Islands together with Western Melanesia and Australia. So that's yet another critical region. And then uh, we've also got North America and parts of Northern Asia. And so uh, what our meso level findings show is that uh, the notion of hotspots is a valid one. So lots of people have been talking about language and engagement hotspots, uh, but we are interested in seeing if these um, kind of um, correlate with the ones that people have brought up in the past. Um, so Krauss, for example, said that North American languages and Australian languages seem to have been severely impacted by endangered, but he also said that languages within Central America were faring better. So uh, our observations support uh, the first statement, but not the second one that he made. Um, then Lowen Harmon says that uh, languages in America and the Pacific are most at risk. Um, and um, yeah, we kind of um, do have that going on over here. Um, and it also supports research that locates the top five language hotspots in the Northwest Pacific Plateau in North America, um, Central South America, Central Siberia, Eastern Siberia, and Northern Australia. So um, these are all valid regions that warrant attention if we were to let the data quantitatively speak for itself as well. So it's not to say that languages in the other regions aren't worthy of, um, of attention. They all equally are worthy of attention, but what's happening over here is that the languages are clustering in um, strange ways and um, the endangerment values of, on, in these clusters um, seem to be um, higher. So, and perhaps something is happening in these areas that should warrant uh, further research. So then at the micro level, we are interested in the nature of each language's location. So we kind of um, are coming down from broad to meso to micro. Um, closeness centrality is used as a measure of a micro level analysis. So what closeness centrality does uh, is that it's used to quantify the relative distance of each endangered language to all other language, endangered languages in the network. So uh, what this means um, simply is that uh, entities with a high closeness centrality score would refer to languages that are centrally located in the network. So they would be they would have lots of connections um, in the network. So they are very centrally connected. Um, and because this is a spatial um, analysis, and uh, we are in the edges represented um, the relative distances in terms of this geography. In our spatial network, the languages that have high closeness centrality would refer to those that are also geographically centralized um, in terms of how it's kind of uh, connected with all these other languages. And entities that have a low closeness 
um, centrality score would be languages that are um, located on the periphery of the network. And in the general scheme of a spatial network, such as the one that we've constructed, this would also refer to languages that are geographically isolated. So immediately we can kind of look back at the map and uh, look at what's happening over here. If you look at these ones, they are particularly, um, there are some, of, some over here to look at as well, but um, these ones are also highly isolated in terms of um, how, in terms of what it's doing geographically. So um, we carried out a one-way ANOVA uh, between groups ANOVA, comparing closeness, centrality, and engagement statuses. And this reviewed that languages found at the periphery of the network were more likely to be critically endangered than languages that were found at the core of the network. So we carried out, um, so this was significant. And then we carried out a uh, post, further post hoc comparisons using the Tukey test. Um, so this also showed that the more geographically isolated languages also tended to be uh, more critically endangered. So again, you know, if we were to kind of look back at the map that was generated, we noticed um, that the region most um, highly affected by language endangerment in um, recent times, the South American Southern Cluster, um, is characterized by such highly isolated languages um, in a geographical sense. So these languages also tend to have um, extremely small uh, speaker numbers. So among these, for example, uh, Kaweska is the only remaining representative of its small language family that's only spoken by about 10 people or so. Uh, Tehoche is a Tonan language spoken by nomadic hunters who will, um, who, and the language is only speaking, spoken by three speakers in Argentina today. So then early on, I mentioned that uh, one of the languages that was critically endangered um, when we were doing this work, but has become dominant in recent times. So you might have read about it. So uh, the last speaker of Yamana was um, known to have passed on recently. So um, that's, that's how things are in this cluster. So uh, finally, one of the last analysis that we could undertake using the micro level measure of closeness centrality um, it's one that investigates the role of linguistic diversity. So the question we asked ourselves was whether or not the relationship between the spatial characteristics of endangered languages and their endangerment statuses would still hold after accounting for linguistic diversity. So we wondered if our spatial network could take into account um, linguistic diversity and it, it could be a significant predictor of endangerment statuses. So we ask these questions because uh, there's often an assumed overlap between um, level of engagement and um, level of linguistic diversity. So for example, um, Ken Hill's 1992 paper in language, um, I think it said, the title was um, on endangered languages and safeguarding diversity. So there's that assumption that um, seems logical, but perhaps ought to be tested that, you know, endangerment of languages equates immediately to the endangerment of linguistic diversity. So here, the spatial characteristic that we utilized um, as a predictor was the micro level of uh, uh, indicator of closeness centrality. The previous one that I've just used, uh, while linguistic diversity is operationalized by the number of unique language stocks, including isolates um, in each of these 13 communities that were returned by community detection analysis. So I ignored the contact languages over here because um, those are a little bit more questionable where classification is concerned or people would uh, uh, yeah, be up in arms if I um, did the classifications a little bit different than what they expected them to be. So um, language classifications over here is derived from the information that's immediately available on LCAT. So ordinary regression is carried out. So a very simple regression analysis is carried out. And within this simple regression model, uh, we found that um, languages that are found in more central locations and in less linguistically diverse regions are associated with better outcomes. Another way of envisioning these results or recasting the issue from a different angle is to perhaps interpret it as, interpret it as this, the opposite. Languages that are found closer to the periphery um, that means more geographically isolated, perhaps, and in linguistically diverse regions tend to be associated with uh, worse outcomes. So, um, so that was that. So to me, it was kind of interesting that uh, my co-PI and I found the results to be interesting in different ways. So as a person who was viewing it 
through that language endangerment lens, it was that uh, language endangerment and linguistic diversity were unquestioningly positively correlated. But for Cynthia, uh, my colleague, she was interested in the computational side of things and she was kind of pleased with the results because um, even after accounting for linguistic diversity, the structural properties of the spatial network were still significantly associated with endangerment outcomes, which kind of attests to the robustness of the network that we constructed. Importantly, and I should have perhaps stated this somewhere, but I have not stated over here, linguistic diversity was only a strong predictor when contextualized within the spatial network that we constructed within those 13 communities. If we were to randomly as assign regions um, and use um, linguistic diversity as a predictor um, in a network that we artificially constructed with uh, regions based on perhaps the continent the language is found on, then um, linguistic diversity was a uh, less strong predictor. So uh, what this means is that um, it has to be contextualized spatially um, when we are looking at a factor such as linguistic diversity. So with that, I presented findings from quantitatively analyzing, computationally analyzing our spatial network of endangered languages at a macro, meso, and micro level. At the macro level, we are able to state affirmatively that linguistic hotspots are prevalent in the world with like languages clustering with other like languages. So uh, with, in terms of their endangerment statuses. Then at the meso level, community detection analysis using the Louvain method identifies 13 communities of um, languages that naturally clustered with each other, each with differing compositions of languages with different vitality statuses. We also note that among these, um, the Southern South America cluster was most at risk. Then at the micro level, using closeness centrality as a measure, we find that spatially isolated languages are more critically endangered. At the micro level, still using the measure of closeness centrality to represent the spatial characteristics of the network. We also perform a separate analysis that look at the role of linguistic diversity. So we found that linguistic diversity alone could not fully account for endangerment levels, but that the role of linguistic diversity was only significant when understood in relation to the spatial structure of the endangered languages network that we had constructed. So again, attesting to how robust the structure was. So of course, um, the next logical questions then um, that stems immediately from research such as this is that, uh, why do these endangered languages pattern the way they do? So situating language endangerment research within the broader spatial context, hopefully it's useful for helping researchers figure out what the environmental uh, mechanisms are that trigger language endangerment. So such as in the work that was undertaken by uh, Linda Bronham, Felicity Meekins and all. So um, hopefully, you know, this research, um, this was supposed to be kind of a, an exploratory uh, piece of work, but it's one that hopefully would be helpful uh, for highlighting patterns of endangerment and regions that we might be uh, placing, paying a little bit closer attention to. So these are the references that I have utilized for the presentation. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Gary Holton at the University of Hawaii at Manoa for highlighting the use of this publicly available data set uh, from LCAT, which is featured on the Endangered Languages platform. So um, terms of use over here follow the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 unported license. So it allows for data to be shared in depth. So um, this speaks to the importance of perhaps some Creative Commons type of uh, uh, work out there. So that's why we could do this. Um, so this work was supported by Grant and then the methodology was mostly provided by Dr. Cynthia Siu. She's written all the quotes for this. Um, and then uh, I have to thank my RA Nadine who did a lot of heavy lifting as well. Our work is currently um, undergoing uh, review and revisions. So that's where it's at. Um, so any issues, errors, clearly our own. Um, and that brings us to the end of today's talk. So thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Nala. Yeah. We've got some time for uh, discussion and questions. If you have a question or a comment that you want to bring up, you can use the raise hand function uh, if you want to be able to just unmute yourself and ask your question. Otherwise, you can also put a question in the chat. If you write it out, I'll read it out for you. Or you can just note in the chat that you'd like to ask a question, and I'll call on you to ask a question. Um, well. Well, Jonathan's ready. Okay, Jonathan, go ahead with the first question. Yeah, I thought I'd get mine out of the way while people think of more interesting questions. <clears throat> um, 
So Nala, excellent paper, and it's, this looks like a really, really useful tool. I can, I can imagine a bunch of applications for it, not least the fact that, I mean, it sounds like it could be quite dynamic as well, as you constantly plug new data into it, the model constantly expands and, and, and develops, which is, it seems to be incredibly useful. Um, I was trying to get my head around a lot of what you said <laughs> as you said it. So I suppose I was, I was thinking for a little while, I was musing on one of those findings where you said that uh, languages that are found closer to the periphery and in more linguistically diverse regions tend to be associated with worse outcomes, which, which seems to be to be intuitive. So, I mean, are you, are you saying then that, you know, traditionally we attribute contact to a lot of this, right? But actually that, that might not be the case here. Is that what you're suggesting? Have I understood that correctly? Could you say that again, the last bit of it? Uh, so so um, traditionally we'd associate contact, right? Uh, with, with, with a lot of the problems that you're trying to compute, computate here. Um, so when you're saying that languages that are found closer to the periphery and in more linguistically diverse regions tend to be associated with worse outcomes, does that mean that, you know, contact is much less important than we might have traditionally assumed in terms of endangerment or, you, or have I misunderstood what you're saying there? Um, there's natural attrition, but there's also a question of why are these uh, classes, why are these languages much smaller ones? What's happening to these speakers? Are there people who are moving out the villages and then coming in contact with other languages as well? So mm. um, those are, but that's a great question. So what's the rule? And I've never thought about it, but um, mm. it's something that everyone, that people can talk about. So what's the rule of contact um, in these um, highly isolated languages? Mm. That's a great question. And I, I mean, don't that's how I, answer. Yeah, that's fair yeah. enough. I suppose it was a bit unfair of me to ask. Um, so because obviously when you're saying periphery, you're saying periphery of the network and therefore more isolated and therefore less contact, right? Yes. Right, uh, okay. Yes. Um, we are assuming little contact in that region itself. But uh, again, like we don't know what's happening to those speakers, whether perhaps if there's an outflowing of people to right. uh, more central regions, then um, if there's no work there and people are going out for- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah actually that- and so, on and so forth, then there would be the issue of contact again. Yeah, that makes sense actually. I suppose I misunderstood you because if I, I was sort of thinking of the classic social network model, right? And you would assume periphery means broader connections outside of the core, right? So they would not be norm enforced. Yeah, uh, no, slightly different from that. Yeah, 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 no, fair yeah. enough. Okay, no, uh, fine, Thank, thanks very no, much. But I Carl. think it's a great question. So what, what's the role of contact in these um, more isolated regions? We don't have a great answer to I don't have a great answer to that right now, but something I want to think of a lot more of, mm. yeah. No, great, no, thanks so much, Nal. No worries. Uh, another question from Tarab. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, for the wonderful presentation. I'm Prabhupada from Pakistan. Uh, uh, I have just a comment. Uh, as you, uh, you, you said that uh, languages which are located in remote regions are more endangered. But the case is uh, uh, like, uh, it's the other way around in the context of Pakistan. Like if we see the most diverse region, uh, linguistically diverse region is Chitral Valley. And the languages which are located in remote regions are comparatively uh, like safer than the languages which are located in the main regions. Uh, although they are minority languages, but still they are comparatively safer. If we see the case of Punjabi, Punjabi is a major language, one of the major language, and the strength of Punjabi speakers is uh, like uh, is is on the top in Pakistan. But still, Punjabi is more endangered than. Uh, than the languages which are located in remote areas. So what's, what's your comment about this? Okay, so I guess like it also depends on what kind of data I feed into the system. So I don't think Punjabi was featured as a language uh, that uh, was fed into the system. So it's not a language that was featured on the endangered language catalog. So I guess there's the question of relative endangerment um, and then those that are, um, so over here we have not, dealt with uh, languages that we deem were a lot more viable than some of the other languages here. So the question is what happens when you feed in um, all of the world's languages. So over here we've got almost half of it, but if you fed in other languages that are deemed to be less at risk, then uh, what happens? Maybe it patterns a little bit differently. Yeah, but this was the uh, kind of uh, limit of the data that set that we had to play with. But I think it's a, it's a great comment and I would Go look at what's happening in those regions myself. Thank you. Thank you.
A somewhat related question about uh, the, the data and methodology. I think your data then represents all languages as points on a map. Is that correct? So obviously that's for practical reasons necessary, but in reality, you know, languages aren't spoken at a single point on the map. And presumably there's some correlation with languages with more speakers and therefore like a lower endangerment index are going to be spoken over larger areas as well. I wonder if there's any chance that this way of conceptualizing language plays into how your analysis works out. Um, well, I can tell you about a problem that we had was that um, exactly as you said, um, sometimes it's not as though it's only spoken at one particular point and there might be the same language spoken in two different countries, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of finagling with the data. We had to do a major data cleanup um, and we decided to treat it as um, separate points. If there were two coordinates, for example, uh, provided at, for one language, we treated um, it as being, um, we treated it as being represented twice in our network because these were different points. Um, yeah. And sometimes these came with different endangerment scores. Sometimes they came with the same endangerment scores, but we represented um, them um, twice. But it's a very good question, especially for languages that it doesn't directly answer your question because I don't have a uh, good grasp or I'm not the one who wrote the codes, but um, that's a very good question. What happens if the language is a lot more spread out than, uh, and versus a language that's less spread out, what happens in that case? Yeah. So presumably, though, when you're double weighting other factors in the model, it might mitigate for that. I'm guessing, but I, I don't know. <laughs> Didn't write the code either. <laughs> well, yeah, hoping yeah that that what that's what it does. But no, this is a great one. So let me bring that to my colleague to think yeah. about. I yeah, mean, it is just the general. You have the mm -hmm. general problem of you know the granularity of the data, and ideally, we would have some kind of speech communities within language groups that we're actually measuring, because there is no sort of uniform language engagement, especially across mm -hmm. you know larger group. Like one village and one city might be completely different from another, but of course, again, that data <laughs> just doesn't exist. Yeah, so that really speaks to you know the importance of um, carrying out very good documentation. That's mm -hmm. not just about the not just the language itself, but about the language. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. So I wish, you know, we had a data set like that it would be great to kind of explore. Yeah, we have a, <clears throat> excuse me. We have a question from Kane Edmund in the chat. He says, thanks for the great talk. Do you think that the European environment would make the picture significantly different in particular, considering the high intensity of globalism in all fields of life? Mm, I think globalization seems to be something that is relevant for a lot more communities out there than perhaps just the European picture. So for example, I'm paying a lot for petrol right now. So, and I, I'm so glad to be driving a hybrid. So I guess globalization does affect me, even though I'm not in that picture. But uh, yes, uh, I mean, um, I would go look at it. I can't answer it um, directly because um, I do not particularly think that it, it's much more globalized than in other areas because globalization is happening at an unprecedented rate in other areas as well as in Southeast Asia and so on and so forth. Like we are all interconnected and affected by what's going on in the world, um, clearly. So uh, with this pandemic and the social situation uh, that's going on. Um, so, but uh, I could go look at the data and figure out if um, it says anything different about that, that European picture, but a uh, good question, yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? I'm going to ask you one more question, but more of the sort of speculating about the meaning of, of your results. And so I recognize you might not have an answer, but it's about that particularly interesting cluster that includes Philippines, West Indonesia, and Australia. Intuitively, that seems coincidental. I mean, what does Australia have to do with Indonesia except geographic proximity? And, you know, I think you've specifically done this in a way that you know, puts the geographic proximity above everything else as a sort of an interesting way of looking at the data. And so um, yeah, this is obviously the design. This is not really a flaw in the method, but I'm wondering how do you how do you decide whether this cluster isn't just coincidental, or uh, is there some explanation for this cluster that you know what, what's meaningful about this cluster that brings together places as different as Australia and Indonesia it, that really may seem to only have their geographic proximity in common. Yeah, so we're assuming over here that geographic proximity means that they experience similar kinds of reality, but that's a good question. So this is actually one for Cynthia, and I wish you were here, but we tested the model at different um, at different um, 
confidence values or different scores. Um, and, um, and our model of 13 communities uh, kind of um, ended up being very good predictors for everything else. So for example, when we threw linguistic diversity in this community of 13 um, different groups would still account for, um, for what was happening in terms of predicting engagement statuses. But um, when you decrease or increase that, um, it, the ability of this model to predict those things uh, fall, as it were. So when um, she's run a lot more tests with it, but you're right, it's how we've kind of conceived this whole plan. So it's kind of letting the data quantitatively mm -hmm. speak for itself. Uh, but of course, we know that um, these things have to be weighed with, uh, with what we know about um, these regions, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is sort of one method of saying, you know, how much can we learn just from geographic proximity? Mm -hmm. And of course, there's other lenses to looking at language endangerment yes. to try to understand a complex situation as yeah, well. Yeah. So this is just uh, the kind of the data set that we had to work with. But of course, uh, we're trying to do other things with data set right now. But um, this was the first piece of thing that we could push yeah. out from the data set. Um, are there any other questions, a final question or comment? Good. Well, now thank you so much for uh, being here to present with us today. Really appreciate seeing this uh, research and these kind of innovative pushes towards using the data that's available, even if it's not always the best data or perfect data sets to try to understand more about what's happening uh, with endangered languages around the world. So thank you for putting this together and we look forward to seeing the final paper when it's out. Okay, thanks for having me today. Yeah, take care right. guys. Thanks everyone for coming. Yep.